Jesus taught those who followed him that we should not let our possessions come to possess us. This was part of his answer to a rich young man who asked him about the path to eternal life. First, Jesus pointed the young man to the Ten Commandments, and when he said he kept all of these, Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Mark's gospel tells us that when the rich young man heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Francis grew up in the luxury afforded him by his father's lucrative textile business. When God called him to rebuild my church, as he prayed in the ruined ch chapel of San Damiano, Francis sold a bolt of cloth and the horse his father had given to fund the building project. This angered his father Pietro so much that he locked his son in a storeroom in their home. You can see the small space today in the church that was built over and around the home where Francis grew up. There inside of the altar of a church that bore no resemblance to a Middle Ages era house is a small ironwork door. No bigger than waist high, the door led to a small stone room with cave-like rough rock walls. Room is too big a word for the space which is said to have been the storeroom where Francis's father imprisoned him in his own home. Looking into that cramped stone space, one can still feel the determination of the young Francis who longed for a life radically conformed as closely as possible to that of Jesus. Francis would be let loose from the room, but his father had one more option. Bishop Guido was a reasonable man who knew the way of the world. The bishop would not let Francis go off the religious deep end in some crazed pursuit of Christ. After all, a bishop had to teach that a child should honor his father and mother. And so Pietro and Francis came to stand on the stone pavers in front of the cathedral church to speak with the bishop. In front of all who cared to watch the proceedings, the bishop ordered Francis to give his father his possessions back. Taking this to the extreme, Francis stripped off his clothes, standing before the bishop and the townspeople having nothing from his family. Bishop Guido clothed Francis in his own mantle. Having followed Jesus' command to the rich young man to sell everything and follow him, Francis did not look back. He inspired other young men who followed suit. In seeing their example, many others who did not sell all they owned felt challenged to grow more detached to their earthly possessions and so simplify their households and their lives. Following Jesus in the way of Francis always held on to this ideal of simplicity that grew out of actually living the gospel out in daily life. A teenage girl inspired by the preaching of Francis made plans to run away from home to join a convent. Chiara Afraduccio had spoken to Francis asking him to assist her. On the evening of Palm Sunday in 1212, she slipped out of the house accompanied by her aunt Bianca and another woman whose name has been lost to time. The three met Francis and others at the little chapel known as the Perchuncula which was a few miles from the palace in Assisi where Claire had been raised, strongly influenced by her devout mother, Ortolana. In the little chapel, Francis gave her a rough woolen habit and exchanged her jeweled belt for a common rope. He roughly cut her long hair short and took her to a Benedictine convent. When her father and his brothers went to the convent, angrily insisting that she return home, Claire, as we know her, is said to have held fast to the altar of the church, claiming sanctuary. She took off her veil to show her cropped hair and said she would be a bride of Christ. Just over two weeks later, he lost another daughter to the convent as Claire's sister, Katharina, joined her, taking the name of Agnes. They remained with the Benedictines until those gathered around Francis built the beginnings of a convent alongside the chapel of San Damiano. Francis insisted that Claire become the abbess, which she did at the age of 21. She wrote the first monastic rule to be created by a woman for what she called the Order of Poor Ladies of San Damiano. Following the orders of Friar Minor that Francis created, this became the second order of St. Francis. Claire wrote, 
we become what we love and who we love shapes what we become. In some depictions, such as the 1972 movie Brother, Son, Sister Moon by Franco Zeffirelli, it could seem like Claire's love was directed toward Francis himself. But those who knew her in her own lifetime wrote of how she was a devoted follower of Jesus, who Francis inspired to a more radically simple life of faith. Pope Gregory IX wanted the order to accept his dispensation from the vow of strict poverty, under which they lived solely on daily contributions. Claire insisted that they needed nothing but Christ. The Pope agreed that no one could obligate them to accept any possessions. Claire clung to a radical simplicity so that her order would not receive lands to farm, but depended on others, and so depended on God to provide. Poverty would be the mark of the order that would, after her death, become known as the poor Claire's. While she remained secluded from the world, the world came to her as bishops, cardinals, and popes visited San Damiano. Francis was in his 40s when his health deteriorated, and Claire tended him at the church he had rebuilt in his youth. She would live another 27 years and see the Franciscans become more worldly as the Friars Minor gained more lands and houses. Despite the pleading of popes, she held fast to the utter simplicity of her rule. She considered herself a servant to the sisters of the order, leading by teaching and the example of her own life. She was first and foremost a woman of prayer. Twice the battles between emperor and pope threatened San Damiano and the town of Assisi. She told the sisters of her order, do not be afraid. Trust Jesus. She prayed before the Blessed Sacrament, trusting God to deliver them. Both times, her prayers were answered. The call to holy simplicity that drew others to Claire fits with the discipline of detachment that is common to many expressions of Christian spirituality. Detachment teaches us not to be so wedded not just to possessions, but our aspirations, especially a longing for power and prestige. When discerning where we think God is leading us, we are to pray detached from the outcome. Otherwise, we are just asking God to bless what we want to do. Paradoxically, both Francis and Claire became famous by seeking God's will and holding fast to living out the gospel simply. Jesus put it this way, life is more than food and the body more than clothing. He added, do not keep striving for what you are to eat and what you are to drink and do not keep worrying. For it is the nations of the world that strive after all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. So it is not that we don't need food and clothing. God well knows that we do. Jesus instead is asking, what are we striving for? If we put our trust in God and seek God's will for our lives, then we will have all we need. Frank and I don't say any of this acting like we have arrived at holy detachment from stuff. We are fellow pilgrims on that journey. As we seek to follow Jesus, we have both found the Franciscan ideal of simplicity to be a helpful aid. We live in a house well suited to our needs, but humbler than what we once aspired to. A smaller house discourages adding to our possessions, yet the storage bins in our garage reveal that we are not poor Claire's. The challenge remains. For example, we love books, and so once we read, we continually give them away, sharing with others rather than being run out of our home by our love of reading. Yes, we might find a new book we want to hold on to, but that means deciding which book or books it will displace. We also try to cook at home using fresh local ingredients as a way of staying more connected to our area and its seasons. And yet, we eat more fast food than we care to admit while traveling the back roads of Central and South Georgia to our congregations. In trying to balance all of this, we have found that the consumerism that drives much of our culture needs to be countered lest we be consumed in the process of seeking more and better things. When life is meant to be so much more than what we own. Who have you known or known about? that lived what you would consider to be a simple life. What would a step toward greater simplicity look like for you?